<laughs> you good to go? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for making the time to speak with us today. Um, for those that don't know, Stephen Schick, world-renowned percussionist, conductor, and educator, and also sort of the curator and mastermind behind It's About Time, a festival of well, you described it the perfect way, a festival of hitting stuff when I saw you at, uh, at your performance the other night. Well, thank you so much. It's been an extraordinary uh, experience, both the planning stages and, you know, and thus far in the festival, just the, you know, the chance to play all of this music. And, and I'll, I'll certainly admit that there's a lot of percussion, but, you know, there's, a, there's other stuff happening, too, which I'm really, really proud of. And it's, a, it's, got, an, it's got an especial sort of focus on on the idea of place and in particular what that means to live here in San Diego and on the border and in Southern California and this both uh, ecosphere but also geosphere that we that we inhabit. I want to talk about all of that. It's about time in conjunction with the San Diego Symphony and about a dozen or so other arts organizations around San Diego. Month-long festival started January 11th running till February 11th. But first and foremost, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit, because besides being you know, one of the greatest percussionists in the world, a writer, a conductor, and all the things you do, you're also an educator. And when I caught you during your, during your percussion, a listener's guide performance, that really came through. It, it was great. It was like a cross between performance and spoken word stand-up comedy and go into a and go into a lecture it, w- it was fantastic how, how big of a part is the educator part of you because it seems like you really revel in it well thank you so much for saying all of those things that's really kind and 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 for me they're 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 kind of a part of the same thing so when i when i think of the role of a musician it's to it's to activate the mind and the ears the spirit of of, of a listener and I suppose in one way or another you could call that education, although I think I think opening a door is more is a, is a, is a better way of thinking of it. And, and when you're actually standing in front of a class and, and, and teaching, you know, basically the last thing I'm trying to do is, is inform people or instruct people. I'm trying also to open up points of access. So when, if you follow those, those different threads, whether it's writing or conducting, playing percussion or teaching, they all end up basically at the same place, which is that we're engaged with the community and we care about the quality of the experience that that community has when they come to our performances. And, and so sometimes that takes the guise of of speaking and, and what looks like teaching, and sometimes it takes the guise of, of playing bongos. I, I remember when I was in my first sort of like jazz workshop class back in the day, my teacher was like, do you know the proper way to appreciate a jazz drum solo? And I was like, huh? You, you got to learn how to appreciate it? I, I sort of just like it. He's like, no, you, you've got to hum the, the, the tune of the head of the song along to it, and you'll get an interesting reference point from what the drummer's yeah. doing. So I think... You know, you are giving people an insight into how these things happened. And look, in and of itself, this music is incredibly captivating. But beyond that, when you get the backstory from someone as entertaining as you, it opens up another level into this music. Well, when when you when when I hear you talk about teaching, it reminds me I haven't thought of this in a long time of this thing that supposedly the Buddha said, which is to say that that learning takes place when someone who doesn't realize he or she is learning. Uh, listen to someone who doesn't realize that he or she is teaching. And that's the moment, you know, when you've kind of abandoned those those rigid roles and you just engage one another, then that's when the interesting stuff happens. In news radio, we have this expression, if you tell someone the news, they're going to forget it. If you tell someone a story, it will live in their heart forever. And I think what you're doing is allowing this music to live in people's hearts forever. You also told an incredible story, and I wanted people to hear this, about how you wound up a percussionist and how it had to do with you passing out on a farm. Oh well, that, oh I told that one. That's right. I, I sort of forget <laughs> the stories. That tell. All the stories are are true, but of course they're they're all there. There are a number of them, but that one was uh, you know my dad was a a farmer. I grew up in Iowa on a farm. I grew up in you know like the well I suppose my period of consciousness in essence as a kid was in the '60s and through the early '70s. So that's my generation. And uh, my dad was a, a farmer. I used to work uh, with him on the farm. I was obliged to do that. <laughs> and uh, it was a hot Iowa day, and I fell face first in the in the hog pit. Uh, I fainted. You know, it was hot and humid and sticky and all that sort of stuff. And as he rolled me over and wiped me clean, I had a vision, which <laughs> which frankly didn't involve farming <laughs> right, for the rest yeah. of my life. 
And I remember that I, that I had a very few things that I was able to do. I think I was like 11 or 12 years old. But I could play the drums in the school band, and I thought, okay, well, this is my only, actually, my only avenue out of here. So at that kind of early age, I was attracted to percussion as a way of life. The path that you chose of that of a classical percussionist, um, were you exposed to that kind of music around the home? Oh, not at all. I mean, my mother was a pretty good amateur pianist, but uh, first of all, she had five kids, and you know, we were a farming family, so there was very little time. I, my er, one of my earliest music memories, though, is listening to her play Chopin after she had put us all to bed, and I'm the eldest, and so I was most likely to still be awake. Uh -huh. And so uh, being on the farm and hearing the sort of wind whipping around from uh, off the prairie and co-mingled with my mother playing Chopin nocturnes was, you know, one of my first musical experiences, and it, and it, it, it both made Chopin into this very gorgeous and nostalgic thing, but it also gave the, the wind a musical quality. So, I mean, I learned a lot just at that, at that moment. But no, no one else in my family, and, and my mother even included, was there, there was not really, it was not a musical family. And so I just um, went to the University of Iowa because it was a state school. And um, after I disappointed my father by l dropping out of a pre-medical program, <laughs> I went to study music. And, uh, but at that time, the percussion the percussionists were the most interesting people, and that was when those pieces were being made. And all of a sudden, I, I just wandered in completely blindly into this world that was under construction. And I didn't know what that was, but nobody else did either. That was the great gift. It wasn't as though I came into this thing that was already rolling and had a bunch of rules. I never would have survived as a violinist or a pianist. But I came into this thing where nobody knew what the rules were, and so I was perfectly suited since I didn't either. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've got friends that I went to high school with that were uh, forward-thinking enough to get in at the ground level of e-commerce. And, uh, and they're like, the greatest thing about it is we're the oldest people doing this. So yeah. there's nobody telling me what to do with my day as, as I go through it. And I guess it's a similar situation for you and percussion. Except I think the earning potential is smaller on my side. <laughs> you know, I can't remember. I think it was when uh, when when Cheech and Chong had their their long rift where they didn't talk to each other. I think they they asked Chong, and I remember this because I was about to go to New England Conservatory of Music and study percussion at the time. Oh, really? And I saw a quote from him, and it was uh, it, it, it they, they said, "Do you do you wish Cheech well?" And he was like, "No." They're like, "How do you feel about him?" He's like, "Yeah." I hope his daughter marries a drummer. And I was just like... <laughs> I don't know if I'd wish that on anyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it seems to have worked out okay for you. So, I mean, this is a, this is a fascinating chat. And the thing I love about your story of passing out, uh, <laughs> passing out while feeding the hogs and deciding that your role would be that of a drummer, at 11 years old, that's when that happened to you? Yes. Because I think Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters and Nirvana, his mom wrote a book where she interviewed the parents of other rock stars you know, to see what it was like raising these kids that would go on to be musicians. And almost universally, they knew, A, there was no other option. B, they knew it between the ages of about 11 and 13. It's when someone, you know, like who is going to make music their life decides that there's no other option for them. So it sounds like you're you're right in line with the rest of the world in terms of being hit by uh, the realization that drums were going to be your life at age 11. Yes, and, 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 and we may, you may not need as much detail, but, but then I didn't actually really follow through with that for quite a while. In other words, I, I really did want to be a doctor, and, I, and I, wanted, I was a good son, and my father didn't want his son to be a musician. Uh, I mean, and I think I understand the, his objections to that. It, it is a hard life. And so it was then actually really much later that I make the, that I made the break. And, and that period of time is worth mentioning because it really instilled in me the idea that I could do something else. I still think that. Mm. Uh, it's, music has been my life, but it's not the only thing I'm capable of doing. And, it's, it, it, and I have lots of other interests. And, and that all has, has accrued to the benefit of my musical life. No, it's interesting what you said about the wind and your mother playing Chopin on the piano. I, first and foremost, if you're ever in Iowa and you hear Chopin, you have to be transported back. Music is an incredible time machine, and you have to be transported instantly back to your childhood should that happen. What I really like about what you said there is something that I've heard you mention in the past, which is percussion is all around you. It's in the wind. It's in the sound of the waves. It's in heartbeats. It's, yeah. it's in everything. To be a percussionist is to be in touch 
with the elements. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's a beautiful part of some of these shows that are being put on through It's About Time. Well, and, and, and to bring it back to the festival per se, you've put your finger on a very important thing. Um, the San Diego Symphony is uh, a treasure. It is an extraordinary ensemble to go to a concert at the Jacobs Music Center and listen to them on the stage of Copley is um, is a thrill. I mean, that's a, that's an extraordinary institution. And that being said, it's not the only way to make to make music. So the the the, the great thing about this festival is that it, it it branches out beyond the concert hall to um, outdoor performances, to performances in relatively unconventional venues at least unconventional by classical music standards like the music box or or bread and salt mm. and uh and it it also has an extraordinary expanse of styles and and of genres uh, there are lectures about music conversations there are there's there's uh, there's a huge variety of both opportunities but also kind of styles and and and, and venue options. Mm. So I think that's really that's really uh, an important aspect of it. But to come back to your question, for me this has always been an indispensable part of being a musician. That is the the question that occurred to me uh, a little while ago, or actually maybe more than a decade ago. What exactly is the difference between the noises I make inside a concert hall and the noises I hear outside the concert hall? Mm. And frankly, in, in terms of the the way they look on a, a you know a a, a, a a spectrograph, not very much. Really. <laughs> and uh, and so to me, I feel like I'm a linguist in the land of noises. I am trying to understand the sounds of my world through the training, through the mind I've developed as a as a musician. And and so that means that I can hear a concert, a, a work on the concert stage, and understand how that relates to the wind. But I can also listen to the outdoors and think. Uh, this is why I know I'm in San Diego as opposed to, for example, Los Angeles or Chicago. And you bring up an interesting point. Geographically, we are set up here in San Diego to do something interesting that you can't really do in lots of other parts of the world. And that is to put on this incredible cross-border performance that's going to be happening. Please talk a little bit about that, because that's in a day and age where people are finding all sorts of differences between one another. I think it's especially advantageous to concentrate on that which makes us the same. And music is a bond, and you are proving that across a border, live and in person. Yes, I think that's really going to be an interesting uh, event. That's next Saturday. The performance is at 1230, and it'll take place at the International Friendship Garden uh, at the border that's really near the water. Um, and, and it will be on both sides of the border. The piece is in Nuxuit, a piece by my, my really close friend, John Luther Adams. It was It's scored for between nine and 99 percussionists. And we'll have a total of around 70 uh, split pretty evenly on both sides of the border. And uh, and so even in spite of the fact that we won't be able to see each other, we will be able to hear each other mm. and we'll uh, and, and be able to play the piece by sound as it goes through this otherwise impermeable border fence there. Mm. Um, and we'll, by the way, uh, uh, be walking in. You know that that's a low-lying land and we've had some rain. And so the, the, the access roads, and this is just for your listeners to know, the access roads are now impassable. But there is a beautiful little walk. Uh, of about a half an hour, you yeah, know, yeah. by hiking, that will take you uh, through that area and then along the beach. And so we'll be, we'll have people there that will, we'll make sure that everyone is well oriented. But it'll be an adventure, and it is a spectacular thing. Uh, the first performance took place in the Canadian Rockies, where we schlepped our instruments in a, almost a mile into the into the into the mountains. And that's a lot to ask of mu- of musicians and also of, of <laughs> listeners to to really. You know, instead of it being right there in front of you, you have to go find this piece. I, uh, and, but it's really gorgeous. I, I remember as a kid loading my drums into cars and cabs and anywhere you had to get them to, you know, to go play elsewhere than the, your living room. I, I remember, uh, I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm coming back as a harmonica player. This is beat. So the the idea uh, that yeah. it involved, like, if we can't drive there, bear in mind, nor can the musicians. <laughs> oh, we're carrying stuff in. Yeah. So um, that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's the latest version of the plan that I've heard. <laughs> this is still under conversation, but we will be there, and it'll be an extraordinary event. Well, the uh, the old expression that goes, "Life is nothing if not a daring adventure." Um, you are uh, you have made 
it's about time a daring adventure not only for yourself and but also for san diego and really for the world because it's an incredible thing from the outside looking in to see this incredible festival of 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 rhythm and sound and place bring people together in such a unique and educational way. And Stephen Schick, thank you so much for, for your part in all of this, and thank you so much for making time for us today. We could talk for hours, but I know you're unbelievably busy, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Well, listen, this has been fantastic. I certainly appreciate the chance to talk to you and to your listeners and and look forward to seeing you and, and others at, at, at events in the festival. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much for the chance to talk.